Salam dəyərli izləyicilər, interaktivin növbəti buraxılışı efirdədir. Koronavirus pandemiyası yayılmağa başlayandan dünyanın bir çox münaqişə ocaqlarında aktiv hərbi əməliyyatlar sənqiyib. İnsanların COVID-19 pandemiyası ilə mübarizə apardığı bir zamanda müharibə savaşmağın nə qədər məntiqli olub-olmadığı barədə fərqli fikirlər mövcuddur dünyada. Ermənistan Azərbaycan Dağlıq Qarabağ münaqişəsində də zaman-zaman ateşkəsin pozulduğu faktları qeydə alınır. Hər gün Ermənistana məxsus hərbi birləşmələr Azərbaycan ordusunun mövqeylərini müxtəlif çaplı silahlardan ateşə tuturlar. Düşmən cavab ateşi ilə suturdur. Paralel olaraq Azərbaycan ordusunun müxtəlif cinahlarda hərbi təlimlər keçirdiyi də məlumdur. Bütün bunlar təsadüfdür mü görəsən? Koronavirus pandemiyası münaqişələrə öz təsirini göstərə bilərmi? Bugünkü buraxılışımızda bu barədə danışacaq və Amerika Birləşmiş Ştatları ilə canlı bağlantımız olacaq bir neçə saniyədən sonra. Qonağımız isə Amerikanın tanınmış hərbi jurnalisti, dəfələrlə Azərbaycanda səfərdə olmuş və regiona yaxından bələd olan müharibə repartiyoru Obey Şahbandar olacaq. So, Mr. Shahbandar, welcome to our program. The interactive program is broadcast three times a week and we usually talk about topics of interest to Azerbaijan. And we hope to have an interesting conversation with you today and we would like to address some of our questions to you. So, Mr. Shahbandar, today there are active conflicts in many parts of the world and the thousands of people are killed. Do you think that the spread of coronavirus pandemic in the world in recent months uh, has affected the existing conflicts? Is there a break in active military operations in the world? So please. First of all, <clears throat> thank you so much for having me on your show. It's truly an honor. It's a very important question because we're seeing this virus hitting every corner of the world, regardless of the country, regardless of the region. Uh, it's hitting poor countries, it's, hit, it's hitting rich countries. But what's interesting here is that it doesn't seem to have had an impact on whether or not countries are more likely or less likely to be in conflict with one another. And that perhaps is what makes this virus so dangerous. For example, if you look at the Middle East, we're seeing increased tensions uh, between the United States and Iran. We're seeing uh, the Iranian activity in Iraq and Syria. We've seen Israeli airstrikes against Iranian military positions and attempts to move military uh, missile components. So it doesn't, the virus at first, in the beginning when the outbreak uh, was first recognized by the international community, there was hope that the world, the countries throughout the world would uh, listen to the United Nations, uh, United Nations Security General, Secretary General of the United Nations had asked that all the, the countries throughout the world would, rec would uh, accept ceasefires, would stop fighting during this very difficult time with the corona outbreak. That doesn't seem to have happened. If anything, we've seen tensions increasing between major powers, between Washington and Beijing. Washington blames Beijing for the coronavirus, and uh, the Trump administration believes that the Chinese government is not being transparent and telling the world what exactly happened in Wuhan. A lot of suspicions in Washington that the virus uh, escaped a lab and a lot of suspicions in Washington that the Chinese government for the first month of the outbreak was trying to cover up what was happening. So now, what the, basically where we are right now is that countries do not seem to be more inclined or more likely to put aside their grievances to work towards a common goal in combating the virus. And that perhaps is very telling of the situation of the world today and the increasing likelihood of competition between major powers, whether it's Washington, Moscow, Beijing, or other countries. That may make this virus even more dangerous if wars break out amidst this terrible pandemic. Yes, uh, and uh, we hope in a couple months this kind of virus pandemic will uh, finish, will end. How do you see the uh, geopolitical map uh, of the world after the end of the kind of virus pandemic? Do you think uh, countries will continue conflicts uh, in the post-pandemic post, -Soviet, in post period or will intensify the peace talks between each other? 
It was interesting because we saw that there was maybe a possibility for countries to decide to work together, uh, to work towards a common goal. You know, we saw that with countries in, uh, in the West, like the NATO alliance, many countries like Turkey and other members of the NATO alliance have been providing, uh, using their military uh, transport planes to transport uh, medical equipment to their allies. So we have seen some measure of global cooperation amongst allies, but we've also seen a great deal of mistrust and distrust between competitors in the geopolitical field. They're worried that perhaps my competitor or my adversary will use the corona pandemic as an opportunity to gain an advantage over me. So that seems to be the thinking amongst many countries in the region because of this geopolitical distrust. So while we have seen, you know, for example, that Washington did offer, for example, Iran, which is a major adversary for Washington, what the Trump administration had offered support to Iran to provide medical equipment on a humanitarian basis, that was rejected by Tehran. And we have seen uh, more, some more military activity by Iran in the region and in the Arabian Gulf region. And we just heard President Trump just a few days ago send a very strong warning to Iran's Ayatollah. So that's just one example. You know, when the experts, many experts believe, had, had hoped actually, that when this, this, since this is the first time that humanity has seen such a global pandemic as this one since the end of World War I, that perhaps it would bring countries together or bring old adversaries together to cooperate on a, on a common goal. But we just have not seen any signs of that. Many countries who are competitors before corona remain adversaries even during and more than likely even after the corona outbreak ends. And I think what's driving uh, even the, the most uncertainty on the geopolitical field is that no country really knows when this v very difficult and terrible pandemic will end. Uh, yes, uh, let's talk about our region, South Caucasus. Uh, uh, we know that you have traveled to many conflict zones around the world as a journalist. You also had reports on the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. I, I remember that you visited Azerbaijan in April 2016 and went to the front line. Do you think the coronavirus pandemic can affect the Armenian-Azerbaijani uh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict? That's also a very important question because the Karabakh conflict and the, you know, the, the, the fight, the ongoing fight between Azerbaijan and Armenia is such a flashpoint for the South Caucasus and a flashpoint that impacts not only the entire region, but the entire world. As you mentioned, I had a, the opportunity to go down to Karabakh, to go down to the front lines, uh, filming a documentary called Black Orchards on the history of the conflict. And, uh, and Azerbaijan's uh, role and Armenia's role and the prospects for peace between the two countries to solve, to find a resolution to this long-standing conflict and to the Armenia's occupation of, uh, of the Karabakh region. And, you know, one thing that I learned from, now, of course, I was there in, that, in, that, in the Karabakh area and in Azerbaijan before that pandemic hit. And one thing, one lesson that I really learned is that this was, for a conflict that was just so misunderstood or little known outside of the South Caucasus, it was just so important. It had such a huge impact, whether it be on the entire region's security and on global security, given that the important role that Azerbaijan plays on the freedom of the energy supplies throughout the rest of the world and as a security guarantor in the South Caucasus and the important alliances that Azerbaijan has with other countries and other strategic allies. And one of the lessons that I learned here is that many of the, the residents, many of the citizens, Azerbaijani citizens who had suffered so much uh, from Karabakh, their homes being taken, their homes destroyed, their family members killed or taken hostage, that they remained so resilient, that they remained still so hopeful. Many, even with having so much taken away from them, that they still remained hope for a better and brighter future. So now we, have, we did see some indications that both sides uh, were willing to sit down and negotiate, but we saw Armenia having a much more hardline position 
uh, despite the fact that Baku had told Armenia that it was willing to negotiate uh, step four and find a just solution for Karabakh. If anything, we've seen perhaps Armenia harden its position on finding a diplomatic solution to this conflict, to this long simmering conflict. And again, we thought, may, many have thought initially, well, given this ongoing pandemic, maybe this would offer uh, a measure, uh, an opportunity uh, for old adversaries and neighbors to come together and uh, towards a common goal. But that just doesn't seem to be happening, despite some initial positive signs that, the, uh, that there could be negotiations sponsored uh, by, uh, by the U European Union and uh, with, with some uh, measure of oversight from the Russians. We just haven't seen any real signs from the Armenians that they're willing to sit down and find a lasting solution that would then normalize relations uh, with Azerbaijan and with Turkey and with the, the rest of the world. And that's really sad, to be honest with you, because on a personal perspective, I made some great friends um, in Azerbaijan when we went to the Karabakh, when we went to the countryside, uh, near the areas that are occupied. And we met with so many families that just want to find a justice uh, for, uh, for their land and to be able to return back to their land and to live their lives, to have their children to grow up in their land uh, that belongs, that's belonged to them for so many generations. So, you know, unfortunately, just from a geopolitical and diplomatic perspective, it just doesn't seem that the Armenians are any closer today than they were last year and before this uh, pandemic to accept a, an equitable solution. I'm asking this question because, as you know, this conflict has been going on for more than 30 years and 20% of Azerbaijan's lands have been occupied by Armenia and there are four resolutions of the uh, UN Security Council and the world community supports the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. And in recent days, the Azerbaijani army has been conducting military exercises on front line. Uh, do you think it's possible to reactivate the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and what are the consequences of Azerbaijan's launch of military operations? I would like to know your views uh, on the impact of the coronavirus on this conflict as well as on ways to uh, resolve this conflict in general. Well, I can tell you that from my perspective as a military expert and defense analyst, the, uh, the balance of power on the battlefield between Azerbaijan and Armenia has significantly shifted and shifted in the favor of Azerbaijan. The Azerbaijani military, from what I've seen, was on the level of a NATO military member that with, in terms of advanced training, in terms of tactics and military equipment. Much of it gained from the West, from allies in Israel, from Turkey, um, from the United States. So what was so a, a very interesting lesson that I learned while we were filming our documentary um, on Azerbaijan and on Karabakh was spending some time, a significant amount of time with the Azerbaijani military. And frankly, I was surprised at what I saw in terms of the military equipment that Azerbaijan ha had, military tactics, and the training that many of the Azerbaijani uh, officers uh, and commanders uh, res received uh, from, from the West. So when I saw the military exercises in Nakhchivan and uh, in, uh, in, in the countryside of Azerbaijan on, on the border with occupied Karabakh, for me, it looked like a NATO military, a, a member of the NATO military alliance. Uh, and that, that is a surprising thing, something you don't expect to see in the South Caucasus. So perhaps certainly the, that should send a very loud and clear signal to Armenia. Now, Armenia obviously depends almost entirely on its military supplies from Russia and the presence of Russian soldiers and the Russian military base in Armenia. But in terms of the technology, whether it's drone technology, uh, whether it's new command and control capabilities, and the significant military hardware and firepower that I've seen the Azerbaijani military deploy in its numerous military exercises, I certainly I believe that we can very accurately conclude that the balance of power on the battlefield has shifted, has shifted heavily in favor of Azerbaijan. 
And the way that this pandemic it will even impact Armenia even more is that the economic situation in Armenia was already very difficult. And with the Armenian economy depending so heavily on funds coming from abroad, the downturn in the global economy is going to also significantly impact, negatively impact Armenia's military readiness. Yes, uh, and my last question is uh, about the uh, impact uh, of the coronavirus pandemic on the balance between uh, world powers because today China's power and influence in the world is growing and uh, which country do you think will be the world's leading country after the coronavirus pandemic? In general, what are the uh, possible impacts of this virus on the uh, reshaping uh, of the world? Now, China is a very powerful emerging military power and China specifically when it comes to the South China Sea area, the Chinese military and the Chinese Navy wants to project its power in an area that's also viewed as is very strategically important to the United States, to the United States Navy, and to America's allies in the Pacific region. Now, the coronavirus has impacted the American Navy in the Pacific. Uh, re remember, there's uh, at least one American carrier strike group now is totally inoperable uh, because of a corona infection on a U made very powerful and important uh, U.S. aircraft carrier that now uh, cannot operate because uh, at least 300 of its crew members became infected with corona. So, and we've seen the war of the words between Washington and Beijing, accusations and counter accusations between uh, these, uh, the two military powers. So it certainly seems that tensions between Washington and Beijing have been uh, exasperated and significantly uh, increased because of this pandemic with Washington laying most of the blame on China for the uh, corona pandemic spreading to the rest of the world. But militarily speaking, China is still very focused on maintaining a zone of control and influence in the South Pacific uh, Sea. It wants to expand its Navy, it wants to challenge American power and proje power projection in the Pacific. Uh, so that's very much a strategic goal of Beijing the U.S. military readiness, specifically when it comes to the American Navy, has been impacted to a degree by the corona pandemic, but I don't think that, that long-term impact um, is going to be uh, very detrimental for the U.S. We've seen President Trump uh, making it very clear that he is going to uh, prioritize and continue to prioritize to expanding the, the power of the U.S. military and to invest um, in the Pentagon. So this is a very a very pro-military president that we have, and a president that perhaps has, been, has had the most adversarial relationship with his counterparts in Beijing uh, compared to all of his previous predecessors um, who've, who've been in the White House. So that's very significant because for this Trump administration, uh, its adversarial relationship with Washington has, uh, with, sorry, its adversarial relationship with Beijing, with the Chinese Communist Party, has become a centerpiece politically of the Trump administration's foreign policy. So we can expect tensions and competition for global power projection, projection between China and the United States to certainly heat up both during the corona pandemic and afterwards. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shah Bandar. Thank you for your valuable feedback. Indeed, the coronavirus pandemic has been a great experience for us, and I think that the existing conflicts in the world must be resolved fairly in the uh, short term. Thank you again. Değerli izleyiciler, bugünkü bıraklışımızı koronavirüs pandemiyasının dünyadaki mövcud münaqişelere təsiri mövzusuna həsr etdik ve bizimle canlı bağlantıda Amerika Birleşmiş Ştatlarından tanınmış muharibə repartiyoru dünyanın en kaynar nöqtelerinde olmuş. Ha belə Azərbaycana da səfər ederek cəhbə bölgesinden canlı reportajlar hazırlamış Obey Şahbandar idi. Gələcəkdə də bu cür canlı bağlantılarımızı davam etdirmək fikrindeyik və düşünürəm ki, tanınmış mütəxəssislərlə canlı müzakirələr faydalı və səmirəl olacaq. Odur ki, növbəti bıraxılışımızda görüşənədək. Özünüzü qoruyun. <gülüyor>